All right, good afternoon to everybody. Today we're going to have Mona Alginde talking from Perry Legal Services here. So she's an expert on this topic. She'll be able to answer all your questions. She spoke many times at these triad meetings before, and she's a great wealth of information for you. So she'll give you a great presentation, and just as always, I'll open up to a question and answer uh, segment for you. Paige is also here. For very least, she's uh, going to be assistant. Eventually, she may take over, is my understanding. So she may be your next resource in the future. Uh, I'm retiring next month, so this is going to be my last meeting for me. So eventually the county will put somebody in here. I don't know who yet. So one day somebody will show up in the uniform and uh, they'll be here for you. Okay. I don't know who it is, but just welcome them and everything will continue on. You guys still got your resources from the other agencies and stuff. Like that. So I wish everybody the best. Okay. All right. So technical difficulties in that I had to pull up an old one, so ignore the date. It is not September 19, 2018. Pretty much everything is the same, um, and whatever isn't, I'll be able to explain to you guys. Thank you. So thank you guys for allowing me some time to kind of get set up. Um, my name is Mona El Gindi. I'm a staff attorney at Prairie State Legal Services. Um, my slides will actually provide a little intro about our services, who we serve, where we're located, there is a printout of the presentation, so you guys have the latest one. There's only a couple minor tweaks that will be different than this presentation up here. All right. So we are a legal aid provider for Will and Grundy County. Um, basically, our mission is to provide free legal services to low-income adults and adults over 60 who have serious civil legal problems and need help to solve them. Um, so we only deal with civil, we don't touch anything that's criminal, and we prioritize the services we offer to those that affect basic necessities. Safety, housing, income, and medical services that may be in jeopardy. Can you guys all hear me? Yeah. Awesome. So the areas that we serve, um, we are one office of 12 that serve 36 counties of Northern Illinois. The only county we do not serve in Northern Illinois is Cook County. Cook County has its own office uh, called Legal Aid Chicago, and that's our old address. Just so you know, we recently moved after this presentation. Um, just a block away from here, we are now located at 18 West Cass Street um, on the corner of Cass and Chicago in downtown Joliet. And so these are some of the other agencies that serve the needs of senior citizens. Um, in Chicago, what used to be called LAF is now called Legal Aid Chicago. In downstate Illinois, it's Land of Lincoln, and then Northern Illinois is us, Prairie State. So some of the typical senior cases that we handle, domestic violence and elder abuse, um, financial exploitation of seniors, loss of housing, nursing home discharges. I'm sure I didn't know until I started doing this work you could be kicked out of a nursing home. Um, appeal of public benefits, health insurance, social security, and primarily public uh, health insurance plans, not necessarily private. And then POAs and guardianship, which I'm gonna talk a lot about today. And then some consumer debt collection cases. So like I said, today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about advanced directives and how they can help you um, protect your decision-making authority, some alternatives when you don't have an advanced directive in place and someone needs to step in, and then different um, forms of legal protection that there are from financial exploitation, which we are starting to see is very much on the rise. And I don't know if it's as much that it's just happening more now, but people are becoming, I think, more aware of it and they're reporting it, and we definitely in our office have been seeing a lot more of these cases in very unique forms. Um, so kind of every case is a little bit different about how we see seniors being exploited. So here's just kind of a breakdown of the different types of advanced directives in Illinois. An advanced directive is a legal document. There's a power of attorney for property, a power of attorney for health care. A living will or a DNR, do not resuscitate, which is now called a POLST, and then a mental health declaration. And I'm going to primarily focus my talk on the top two. So a power of attorney is essentially 
a person delegating decision-making authority to someone else. They are making that conscious choice when they have full capacity. The two kinds that are most, pow are most popular are healthcare and property. There really are no other kinds of power of attorney. Uh, we do these all the time in our office for free. Uh, we have pro bono attorneys who help us with these. I will do these. Um, different people in the office can do them. We can go to the home of the person if they can't get to us. So if this is something that you know someone is in need of, you can contact our office and we can set something up. A healthcare power of attorney deals with your personal care decisions, your health care, your medical treatment. It, it covers admission to hospitals, nursing homes, mental health facilities. It also deals with health care records, right? Who can access them, who can see them. A health care, I'm sorry, a power of attorney for property, a lot of people think, well, I don't have property. Do I need that? It's only called property, but it deals with all of your financial decisions. Paying your bills, getting your benefits, your taxes, um, you know, renting, you know, signing an agreement to rent a, a, an apartment. All of that would be under a property power of attorney. And both of these powers of attorney can be customized to say whatever it is that you may want them to say. So if you decide to have a power of attorney for property, the first question you need to ask is who can you assign to be your agent? It want, you want it to be someone that's trustworthy, someone that's willing to do it because they can decline. It's not like a duty that they're forced to do it. And you want to think about a successor because for whatever reason, if that power of attorney is unwilling or unavailable, then unless you have a backup, there will be no person to act as your agent <coughs> if needed. You also, when you execute a power of attorney for property, you want to talk about what the scope of the authority is. Um, it can be as broad or as limited as you want, and the duration. It can exist until you decide to revoke it or until you pass away, or for a shorter time. You know, sometimes people will designate powers of attorney for just a transaction, right? You might be selling a home, you might be out of the country, you need someone to take care of the legal paperwork for you, you will assign power of attorney to someone. That is the same relationship, but it's just, of course, for a very limited duration. So here's kind of a breakdown of the different powers that you can give your power of attorney for property. There's a lot there. These are essentially the ones that are listed in the statutory form, which is the forms that we use. So under the law, they actually have a sample form. And um, those are the forms that we prefer to use because obviously there's no question about the legality. It is from the law itself. But then you can always customize these things and take things out if you choose to. Now the one power I will say that is not automatically listed there is the power to gift money. And I'll tell my clients because they think, well, why would I ever want to give somebody the power to give my money away? If you have lots of money and you want to take advantage of tax things, you know, obviously the tax benefits of giving gifts and things like that, donations, you want to specify that in your power of attorney because rightfully so, it's not going to be an automatic power that they would have using this form. But you do not have to let someone gift your money away by any means. So now your agent has a duty when they do act as your power of attorney to act uh, with due care. And these are the lists of the duties that they must perform. They must record all financial transa transactions that they take, right? You as the principal who's giving this power, you have a right to ask for an accounting at any time. Hey, power of attorney, I want to know what you're doing. <coughs> Send me an accounting of what you've done so far. That is under the law your absolute right to do. You want to make sure they're paying the bills, making good financial decisions, not just any financial decision. Not commingling of funds. A lot of times powers of attorney will be your children, your spouse, your sister, your sibling. And you know, the biggest thing that we see is just commingling of funds, which really creates difficulty to say, well, how are you managing their money? And did you treat it as your own money? Which is when you start to see the financial exploitation cases that we see a lot of. You want to keep them separate at all times. Be aware of available public benefits. Yeah. Just a quick question. The power of attorney kicks in after you're incapacitated, right? Well, that is something you can choose. You can have it take effect the day that you sign it, even if you have full capacity, or you can choose it to take effect after you become incapacitated. Okay. But that's a good question. Does that have to be spelled out? 
it has to be spelled out and there is a question on the power of attorney of when it takes effect. So it's not automatically one or the other, you have to state what you want it to be. So good point um, to bring up. Now the other thing in relation to that is a durable power of attorney and most powers of attorney will be good even when you lose capacity, even if you haven't specified that it will be good after you lose capacity. That starting date is what's gonna trigger it to take effect. So I was also talking about public benefits. A lot of times we will see cases where <coughs> seniors are in a nursing home and they've used up all their funds and they're now being threatened to, kick, to be kicked out of the nursing home because they're not able to pay the monthly bill and the power of attorney will not realize you can apply for Medicaid and Medicaid may cover the remaining time that they have in this facility and so those are the kinds of things that the power of attorney should be aware of. What benefits are out there that they can get for the principal? Now just a tip I have, the last point there, if the agent and the principal live together, then it's really important to have a written document about how those living expenses are going to be divided. Because again, it's gonna look like, why are you taking mom's money to pay all the bills? Well, if there was an agreement that mom was gonna pay bills A, B, and C, and you know, child was gonna pay bills D, E, and F, you wanna have that somewhere specified so nobody questions it. Now some of the signs of a breach of a duty. The principal never sees bills or checkbooks, and we see this a lot. Um, agent refuses to talk about finances. The agent is having their own money troubles. You know, I've had agents come in and they're like, well, mom would have loaned me $10,000 if she knew I was in trouble. That's not really something mom can do if you're acting as her power of attorney. Unless it's specified in that power, those types of things are not automatically allowed. So just to be aware of those kinds of things, um, that those can be signs that this may not be the way it's supposed to be. Involuntary discharge from a nursing home. That's almost like for us, because we, we get those referrals automatically from the nursing homes. That's a sign to us we need to find out where the money's going. If it's not going to the nursing home, we need to track where it is. Um, the agent talks to other finances, about finances, but doesn't allow others to talk to the principal. That means isolation, right? That person, and we've had cases where the senior may be living with a child, but the other children don't have access to them and don't really know what's going on. And that is usually a red flag of, you know, you need to find out what's happening and see what's going on. Um, the agent won't do what the principal wants. So even when you designate someone as your agent, you still have full authority to do what you want. It's not like you give it up because now my child is my power of attorney, I've lost all my decision-making authority. It's actually quite the opposite. All you've done is you've shared that authority with them. You still retain authority until, of course, a court may designate you no longer have the ability or you're incapacitated and the decisions you wanna make are not really in your interest, like I wanna give out all my money to the neighbor who I've never met before. That's when you want an agent to be saying, no, no, we're not gonna do that, we're gonna do something else. But, but you don't lose that authority just because you signed uh, someone up as your power of attorney. Another question we get a lot, a power of attorney for property versus a will. Do I need both of them? Well, they both work very differently because they take effect at different times in your life. A power of attorney is only good while you're alive. A will is only good after you die. So one will not replace the other. Unless your power of attorney will manage all your property that you don't have any more property after you die, but that's another story. Um, so a lot of times people think, well, I have a will, so I don't need a power of attorney. The will has no power over your property until you're gone. The, the power of attorney is really what you want while you're alive to help you pay your bills, take care of finances, file your taxes, all the things that you may not want to do as you get older in age. Now a power of attorney for health care, obviously the same factors, you want someone that you can trust, um, someone who is emotionally strong to do what you want and not necessarily what they want. You know, I've had um, clients of mine come in to do powers of attorney for health care and they very strongly believe in certain medical procedures and their children for whatever religious reasons may be appalled by it. And I need to talk to the client and say this might not be the right person because they may have a hard time to do what you want if they think it's wrong or, or whatever. 
So just so you know you pick someone that while they love you and care about you, they're also gonna be able to respect what it is that you want and not kind of step in and do what they think should be done. And this applies like, you know, end of life decisions, um, burials, things like that. I remember I had a client that was, she wanted to be cremated and her kids were just like not okay with that. And at the end I was like, look, put it in the power of attorney because then nobody can question it and hopefully they'll do what you asked for. Um, but just good things to think about. The duration again is you decide now, a power of attorney for healthcare, a lot of times these are done at hospitals, um, but like I said, we do them in our office as well. You don't have to wait till you go to a hospital. Sometimes I've had clients say, well, I'm just gonna do it when I go to the hospital. The only thing about doing it at the hospital is you don't have a lawyer that's gonna be explaining all this wonderful stuff to you while you're doing it. Sometimes they just say, sign here, all right, thanks, here you go, here's the document. And then here's a list of the sample powers that you can give to your healthcare agent. Of course, you can limit them if you choose to. I've had clients who say, I never want to go to that hospital because they're horrible. I never want to be in this nursing home because I've heard horror stories. <coughs> you know, just keep in mind, of course, with those limits, 10, 15 years down the road, you don't know if they'll still be how you feel. So really, you want to pick someone that kind of knows what you want. The duties of your healthcare agent, obviously to discuss with the doctors and nurses the treatment plans, make medical decisions, um, make anatomical gifts. That's a power that they have if you haven't already designated what you want. Um, an agent can resign at any time and that's applicable for both powers of attorney. And then here are more signs of possible breaches of this power of attorney. You know, the, the principal is not doing well, is, is sick, is, wasn't sick before, doesn't have visitors, um, gets moved around. A lot of times we see that, you know, where so that nobody can kind of track what's happening to that person, they'll just get picked up and moved somewhere else, and then picked up and moved somewhere else. So those are all kind of red flags that things may not be appropriate with the power of attorney. And a power of attorney can always be undone. And it can be undone either by the principal if the principal has, a, has capacity, or by a court, if there's a case to be made that this person is not acting in the best interest of the principal. And so this was kind of, I was predicting the next slide. Um, how to stop a breach of a duty, to terminate or revoke the power of attorney, to educate the agent on his or her duty. Sometimes that just might be the issue. Agents won't know that they're supposed to be doing whatever they're supposed to be doing um, and you can send them to our office. You can you know, give them some literature. There's a lot of online stuff. Of course, you can always contact us. You can contact police. Um, you can contact Adult Protective Services, which is the agency that is specifically looking out for older and disabled adults who may be in a vulnerable position and may be taken advantage of one way or another. So a living will, just to let you know what it is versus a will that I've already talked about, a living will only directs your health care provider to the kind of life-sustaining treatments that you want. It will not override a health care power of attorney, um, and it also doesn't assign a decision maker. So if you kind of look at this graphic, the living will deals with just a tiny bit of what a power of attorney for health care deals with. So I tell people, if you have a power of attorney for health care, you may not need a living will. But some people want it very clear what, what kind of end of life treatments they want. And that is what a living will is. It has nothing to do with your property, which I know is very confusing why they call it a will when it's not like a will at all. Um, the other time a living will is good is if you really don't have someone you trust to have that kind of authority under a power of attorney, but you just know what you want done, then a living will says, hey, healthcare providers, this is what I want done. I don't really know who the best person to do it is, but I'm just making that decision you know, on paper documented so there's no questions about it. Now these are other types of advanced directives that I'm not really gonna talk about. They're not very common. Uh, physician's order for life-sustaining treatment, which is what used to be called the DNR. It's pretty self-explanatory. A mental health treatment preference declaration. It's kind of like the power of attorney for healthcare, but it deals very specifically for people who suffer from mental health issues, 
it's a lot more limited in how long it lasts and what powers that person has. I don't see them a lot. Um, so that's just so you know that's out there for people who suffer from mental health decisions. And the reason that's out there is because obviously to execute any legal document, you need to have full capacity. Someone with a mental health condition, they may not always be in a full capacity mode to execute a legal document like a power of attorney. So there's this alternative that's a little lesser that they can give someone authority to make decisions or override their decisions if need be. All right, so now we're gonna talk about, well, I never made a power of attorney and now things are going bad and I'm losing my ability to make my own decisions or you know someone who is in that position. What can you do? There are two options. Guardianship is where you need to basically petition the court to say this person no longer can make their own decisions, so you need to assign a guardian to take care of those decisions for them. And that, of course, has to be done by a court. It cannot be done just by signing papers. Um, a power of attorney has more power than a guardianship. So in your power of attorney documents, you can say, if I ever need a guardian, I'm nominating this person to be my guardian because that gives the court heads up that when you were in your right mind, you were able to say who you wanted to be that person. But ultimately, it is the court's decision in that type of case. The other situation, which deals with only healthcare decisions, is called the healthcare surrogacy law. And that's when you have someone who is unconscious and there is no power of attorney for healthcare. The physicians get to decide some secondary person that can make the decisions for them. And the law basically has a list of people they go through. Spouse, I believe, is first. Second will be, ch will be your, your child. Um, and then I don't know, I think it's nearest relative. And so I say, you know, that's kind of a backup, but if you don't like your spouse and you don't like your children to make decisions for you, then you really want to have a power of attorney because they're the people who they're going to ask first about what should happen to you. So. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about protecting seniors from financial exploitation. So there are several laws in place that do that, and I will tell you, in my, I've been at Prairie State for six and a half years, and I have seen such a dramatic increase in these cases, and I will say, and Paige, my VISTA, who works with me now in these cases, the laws are not enough for how to protect people because people find holes and cracks all the time. Um, but at least this is what we have, and a lot of times they can be helpful. So I think this is an area of law that definitely needs to change um, to be able to protect seniors because we just find people finding ways around it. So the Elder Abuse and Neglect Act, the first one listed there, is essentially the law that gives APS the power to, to do what they do. APS is the Adult Protective Services System in Illinois. In Will County, um, you are, it's Guardian Angel is the agency that is where APS is. They have a hotline, you can go online and look them up. They will come in, they have authority to investigate if there's some concern about abuse, exploitation, self-neglect. Um, they have some powers that other people don't have on the state level to like put a freeze on an account if there's questions about what's happening in that account, to call the police. They're wonderful and we work very closely with APS so just so you know, there is an agency that that's all they do, is they step in, they investigate, and they kind of find out if there's more that needs to be done. So we don't really deal under this law, but just so you know, that protection is out there. The Domestic Violence Act, which is a little bit more common, is essentially the law that provides you the ability to get an order of protection, right? Um, and exploitation, is a form of abuse, along with other forms of abuse, which can be, you know, neglect and not caring for someone and, and isolating them. Um, under the DV statute, you can seek an order of protection for up to two years, and it will prohibit the abuser from having any contact with the victim, um, any exposure to their property or anything like that. And there can be a criminal penalty if they violate the order. So this is a very strong legal remedy but it's not always the easiest to get because there's kind of a high bar of what abuse actually is. It can't be really, you know, my kids took $100 and won't give it back to me. You're not gonna get an order of protection against them, so. The 
Now the Probate Act, which governs wills in Illinois, also has some protections in there, um, specifically unrelated caregivers who will obviously be very involved in an elderly person's life, you know, at the end of their life. If all of a sudden there is a transfer of a large amount of money to them, it will automatically be questioned and presumed inappropriate until proof can be provided that it was appropriate. So those are just, you know, a few protections that are there just to ensure that, you know, vulnerable adults are not going to, you know, get away with people, or, or people taking their money will not get away with it. But I'm sure you can kind of imagine people can still find ways to get around with it. Well, I'll just make it less than 20,000 or whatever. The Illinois Power of Attorney Act, which I talked a lot about with you guys, basically is a legal document to kind of put some protections in place and to protect you. And there is a legal remedy if your agent is acting improperly and the principal can't really direct them to stop, it can go to court and someone can file on their behalf to make them turn over an accounting and then pay back all the money if you can prove that they misappropriated funds uh, from the principal. Now this act is actually a criminal statute but there is a civil side to it that you can file a lawsuit in court. Um, it essentially deals with a person in a position of trust who uses or takes property of an elderly or disabled person. They would, increase, they would face increased penalties, um, particularly if the victim is over 60. And I think the older the victim is, the higher the penalties are. Um, of course, the value of the property and the civil remedy is you can sue them and they can be liable for three times the value of the stolen property. Now, the only thing I will say about a lot of these civil remedies is a lot of times when that money is taken, it's gone. Like it's not sitting in another bank somewhere that you could say, hey, give it back. This is what we see very commonly. So I would just say, whatever you can do proactively to protect yourself, your elderly family members, um, to not kind of fall where it's too late and the money's gone is the best option because these lawsuits are very difficult because I have yet to see that we've like found a chunk of money somewhere that we could grab. Sometimes you can, sometimes there's a house, sometimes <coughs> there's something, but, but it's not very easy. And the police of course can only arrest the person, right? They can't really make the money come back either. So, all this information, I have a little simple scenario for you guys. So um, I can have you guys read it. It's also in your packet. Um, and then we can talk about whether or not we think exploitation happened here. Are you guys okay with reading it on your own or would you like me to read it to you? Okay, You still reading? I know you didn't think it was a reading quiz, right? I know this is really not fair. I used to be a high school teacher, I'm sorry, so I just like to throw interactive things in my presentations. Um, okay, so we can talk about it. How many of you think that Sammy is an exploiter? Raise your hand. All right, good. Yes. He or she, I don't know if I said he or she. No, she. She is an exploiter. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that, even though she had really good reasons to do what she did. <coughs> so Sarah's funds can only be used to benefit Sarah. And that's really hard, I think, for like parents to think about like, oh, but they need that and it's good for them. 
but that's really how it's supposed to go. And as a power of attorney, Sammy is a fiduciary, so she can't do anything as a power of attorney that would benefit herself. So power of attorney is not just you are helping mom and you're doing this. You're now at a higher legal standard to put their interest before yours. And so sometimes I'll have clients come and they'll say, my kids help, help themselves to all this money from my joint account and I want it back. If it's a joint account, I say, you know what, you didn't realize that, but they were an owner in that account. So technically, they had the right to take all that money. And I know people are like, but that was all my money. And they knew it was all my money. Well, when you put someone else on that account as a joint owner, it's now both of their money. However, if that person who's on your account is a power of attorney, a different standard now applies and they really can't just go and take all your money. It's not the same. So, so having a power of attorney, you know, while you give them all this power, there is some protections that come with it as well. And then none of the purchases were there, were there to really improve Sarah's care. Question. Now, sure. Um, all right, so I have my daughter's name on my account so that if I have to do my check, so should I make her a power of attorney? Is that something? That is something you can do. And now, you know, I don't want you to walk away and be like, oh, I have to change everything. You have to think about your own personal needs, right, and what is best for you. As long as you know having her as a joint owner makes her you know, an owner of this account, which also might open, open you up to liability, right? If someone sues her and they get a judgment and they wanna like access her money, which may be in your account, that's gonna affect your money as well. Whereas if it was only your money, that's social security, that kind of money gets protected from judgments or anything. So there's a lot of legal implications that you may not realize that are there when they're joint. And so it may just be better to have a power of attorney and then have the bank know that so she can write checks for you. I can't give any specific, just so you guys know, I can't give any specific legal advice to any situation. We're just using that as a hypothetical. So if she had the power of attorney, she wouldn't have to be on my account? She would not have to be listed on the account because power of attorney acts in your name. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions? So some other strategies, just to kind of keep note, um, keep good records, screen caregivers. Caregivers can sometimes be wonderful and also maybe helping themselves. I see this a lot, especially family caregivers. It is a very difficult situation. You know, I will tell you the scenario that we just talked about. I will a lot of times be representing Sarah, and Sarah will be like, she's my granddaughter. She takes care of me. I'm not going to stop her from what she's doing because I don't have anyone else. And that's where I feel like the laws are not really, because that is so common, right? That that person is essentially taking advantage because you need them and there's no one else. And they know that. And they're like, all right, get rid of me. Then who's going to come take care of you and do all these things for you? So this is where, you know, I don't know if any change can be made, but, but this is where we see a lot of things where people get away with it. And it's very hard. Um, so hopefully proactively people can make clear and find ways to protect their money and do things so it won't kind of get to that. And then we have some information on our website um, for Prairie State Legal Services. Uh, if you ever want information about the other services that we offer, you can call us. Um, we have a working relationship with agencies that serve Will County to refer cases to us, so we'll, we'll refer them to you, sorry, we'll refer you to them uh, if it's something that we don't do, because we can't do like all legal problems. We, we our grants um, specifically limit what we can and cannot do. Um, and then there's our Joliet office phone number there. And, yep, that's my presentation. So now I'm happy to answer any non-specific to you case questions or anything about the presentation. Did you already cover living trusts? So I did not cover living trusts. And we in our office don't really do living trusts, so I'm probably not the best person to cover them because we don't do them. Okay. The only thing I can say about a living trust is it is a way to, to talk about your assets that can survive death that may or may not impact whether you want a will or not. But we don't, we don't do them in our office, so you don't want to hear from me about living trusts. We also don't do wills in our office just because the need is so high for the other areas, but we can refer you to some pro bono attorneys who will step in in certain situations 
and to um, different private attorneys who can do them for decent fees. So you really focus on power of attorney? We focus on powers of attorney. We focus on anything dealing with your basic necessities. So anything that's affecting your safety, your housing, that's not one of the things I listed, call us. And if it's not us, we'll tell you where to go. Yeah. Just a general question about, about a will. Say I, have a, I make a will out and I say I'd like you to be my executor of my will. And you've told me many times I don't want to have anything to do with being an executor, da, 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 and I pass away. Okay. Now what happens? Well, I would guess only because I haven't had that situation happen, if that's what's on paper, they'd have to make the case to the judge why they should not be the executor or why someone else, and, and sometimes they'll work ways to do that. But if what's on paper is what's on paper and they haven't done anything to undo it, then I think that's what stands. Okay, so, so if someone made me an executor of the will and I didn't want to, I'd actually have to go in front of a judge and explain why I did not want to do it. Potentially, because I don't deal with these cases, I don't know if there's a way around that, but that would be my, yeah, the judge ultimately is the one that's gonna foresee what happens to the estate and find a way around that if there is a way around it. Any other questions? All right. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Triad works to improve the quality of life for seniors by providing an opportunity for the exchange of information between public safety, social services, and seniors. There are no membership papers to fill out or fees to pay. Everyone is welcome to attend. Each month, we present a guest speaker on subjects that keep you informed and up to date on the latest scams, frauds, and other criminal activities. We also discuss safety issues, home preparedness, and staying healthy. Triad meets the fourth Thursday of every month. Contact the Newlands Police Department at 815-462-6100 for more information.